All right. How's everybody doing? Good? Um, glad that uh, you are here. It's good to be together again and see all those nice faces out there. Um, I'm going to pray one more time, and then uh, we'll, we'll jump into this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for this morning. We praise you for the time we have to, to come together. And Lord, uh, I just pray that um, you would continue to show us uh, what this time um, can look like um, as, as a family, as, as uh, your kids and, and your children. So Lord, we just um, trust you in that, um, that we aren't here just to play church, but to, to, to do something more. And Father, um, we get lost in all the other stuff. And I just pray that you would help clear that away. Um, we need your help there. And help us understand uh, what church is and, and who we are and, and what this time um, is meant to be. So uh, we give it to you now. And, and uh, Lord, we uh, want to continue in our, in our worship of you as we dig into your word. And, and Holy Spirit, I pray that um, you would speak and that if there's anything that needs to be changed from first service to this service, left out, added, whatever, uh, Spirit, that you would please do what you need to do. And I pray that we would be clear and, and, and focused on what it is um, you need us to hear. So we also know that, that Spirit, that you're, you're the convincer and the convictor of sin and the encourager and, and these things. So um, Spirit, would you please speak um, to each heart um, where we're at um, and that we would, that we would listen. Um, and, and go beyond listening to, to applying it and using it uh, in our lives, not just leave it. And so, Father, we give this time to you and, and trust that your word um, does not return void. So please, in, in your power and your strength, um, and do what you will. And we just pray these things in your name. Amen. <clears throat> so story... Um, Erwin McManus shares, Erwin McManus is a, is a great Christian author. I enjoy uh, a lot of, of his writings. He shares a story about a car uh, that he uh, had bought and had for a while. And this car had over 100,000 miles on it. Anybody own a car like that? Yeah, me too. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a good car for him. It ran perfect, but the outside was pretty beat up. Anybody have a car like that? Yeah, me too. And uh, it was pretty rough, beat up, and, and uh, needed a little bit of work. So he thought, you know what, I'm going to spend some money on this car. And uh, he decided to have it repainted. Uh, to kind of have the rust removed and fixed up and repainted. So he got it all looking good and shiny and, and uh, waxed up. And it looked beautiful. And he says, uh, not too long after this, though, it died. And it never has run again. So the problem is what? He didn't do what? Fix the engine, right? He uh, made the outside look really good, really pretty, really beautiful, but he ignored maybe some of the bigger issues on the inside. This morning, uh, we want to talk about integrity uh, or character um, in, in us and in, in the the call to integrity in our lives. And the simple definition uh, of integrity is this. And it's interesting, to be whole. Now you'll get some different, uh, different definitions, but this one is, is to be whole, to be complete. Uh, when we think of Erwin McManus's car, uh, it looked real good, but it wasn't whole. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't complete. Um, and he goes on to say this. He says, integrity fixes the engine even when the paint is peeling. When the engine is running, you can count on the car to get you where you want to go. But when you ignore the engine, a beautiful paint job only promises you will look good while you are broken down on the side of the road. Does that make sense? And as we move in uh, to this idea of integrity and character. And, and again, that's what we're called to live. If you're here and you claim the name of Jesus, you belong to him, you're following him, uh, moving in him, man, we, we should be the most honest and <laughs> people uh, on the planet, have the most integrity uh, and character and honor uh, that we're called to have. Um, and we're called to take care of our engine, our heart, and as we move through this, uh, he still speaks. You, this is going to come up again over and over. It was last week, heart conditions. This is just another heart condition. 
And it's just another uh, area of the heart that we need to, to look at um, this morning. Uh, when we ignore that, and we ignore the heart, and we're just uh, looking good on the outside, doing our best to look the part, um, guys, we lose ground as a church. And we lose ground as a people because what happens is those who don't follow and those who are outside of Christ that we're around see us and uh, they can see right through the fake paint job. And they can see through that. And so we, we kind of tend to lose ground and it's a problem because we're claiming one thing and we look all shiny and fancy but the inside um, there's some things that are broken that we need to acknowledge um, and at least be real about. Uh, with those those people. So this morning we're going to start in Matthew chapter 5, if, if you've got your Bibles, with the words of Jesus. And, and he's teaching, uh, this is an awesome chapter, there's so much stuff in here, and we'll, we'll be back in Matthew chapter 5 um, in this series. Uh, but I want to start with verses 33 through 37 uh, and see what he says here as he's preaching. He says this, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is, by, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is, it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not even swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, I want to give just a little bit of background. I know we jumped right into this in the middle of Matthew chapter 5. I want to get just a little bit of background on what Jesus is saying here. Um, in the Old Testament, um, people could swear an oath, okay, using God's name even, which sounds a little crazy, but, but as I researched this, this was something that, that was permitted by the law. They could do this using God's name. And what they would do is they would swear by that, make that oath, make that promise in God's name because it would have teeth, right? We do the same. It made it have teeth. They had to be faithful to that commitment. And the law said you had to be faithful to every oath that you made um, using God's name. You were held to that promise. You were held to that oath. Now, what began to happen, and Jesus kind of addresses it here, what began to happen is they would begin to swear, okay, not cuss, I'm not talking about, you know, throwing out some swear words, but swear, make a promise, make an oath by other things. Now, Jesus mentioned the throne. Jesus mentioned Jerusalem by, by my own hair. Um, they began to, to choose and, and make oaths and swear by something else. So it wouldn't be as binding. Now, do you know what they were doing? Just like we do. They were looking for loopholes. I swear by the white hair on, well, not on my head, on my, on my mom's head. Okay, I'm not going to use God's name to make this because that's binding. I'm going to start looking for loopholes. Does that make sense? And so, so Jesus is addressing this. People don't change. You know, people don't change at all. And so Jesus speaks to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter here really is integrity. It's character. It's honor. Jesus knows the hearts of men and women. He knows your heart and he knows my heart better than we know them. And hearts of men and women have not changed since creation. And we know Jesus was there. All things were created through him. And he knows human beings better than we know ourselves. And he knows that you and I can make an oath or make a promise with no intention to keep it. Has anyone ever done that? Anybody courageous enough to raise your hand? Ever made a promise you didn't keep? Have you ever made a promise that you never even intended to keep? Thank you for your honesty. Yeah. I bet most of us have done that at some point. Uh, saying we will do something, thinking in the back of our heads, no, nah, not a chance. Yeah, he, he knows that about the human heart. We, he knows that, that we're pretty good at being deceitful. And so Jesus is saying, here he is, he's preaching to these people, look, man, if you belong to me, you should have so much character, you should have so much integrity that no oath is even needed. You don't have to swear. That your yes should simply be a yes and your no should simply be a no. You should be trusted with that. And that should be enough. As a follower, 
A yes or a no is enough. James uh, talks about this too, and he, he uses these words. James 5.12. Uh, I said the wrong one last time. Above all, he says, my brothers and sisters, do not swear by heaven, not by heaven, or by earth, or anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. So I got to thinking about this, this idea of, of being a, a man of, of our word or, or women of our word, um, people of our word, a people of integrity, and to live a life of, of honor and character. What's that look like? Does anybody, can anybody think of somebody in your life that you would say, that person has integrity? Can you think of anyone? Does anyone come into you? Don't shout it out, but nobody has, nobody knows anyone with integrity. Okay, good. Chad does, and Brian. Okay, good. Few of us do. Yeah. Hopefully there's some people that pop up that you're like, they are. They have character. Not that they're perfect. Not that they don't mess up, but, but they're, they're known to have integrity. Um, you can trust them. Um, I got to thinking about that and, and uh, even going into the scriptures where we want to go. And, and I thought of um, one of my favorite uh, characters and, and one of my favorite uh, events series of events in history and, and that's the, the, the man Joseph not, not the Mary Joseph um, but the Old Testament Joseph the coat of many colors Joseph you follow me if, if you're familiar with the scripture if not uh, this is an incredible story we're going to kind of walk through it really quick this morning we're really not going to do the whole thing justice but for time's sake uh, we're going to pull some things out because as we look at Joseph um, not a perfect man but uh, we see in his life that he had integrity uh, we see a lot of moments where he showed honor and character and integrity. He had all kinds of ups and downs, just like you and I. Um, and those things molded him and crafted him into a man of integrity and character. So we want to start um, with just two tests of integrity that we all face. Um, and the first one is this, the adversity test. The adversity test. It tests our character. Now, we've all experienced this in life. On some level, uh, we've all experienced a trial. Uh, we've gone through some suffering. Uh, and our faith and our integrity is tested in those times. Now, again, there's so much uh, in these chapters. Um, we're going to kind of walk through it briefly. But I want to start in chapter uh, Genesis 37. And uh, kind of pick up here, and, and uh, we're going to see that, that if you're familiar with Joseph, Joseph uh, was one of many brothers, and uh, it was really the father's favorite. Uh, he, was, he was a daddy's boy, and dad loved Joseph really more than he liked and loved the other brothers, which you can understand, and you would uh, see that this creates a little bit of a tension uh, with his other brothers. And so we're going to read verse 37, 4, just kind of see this says this, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they what? They hated him. And they could not speak a kind word to them. So there we get the picture. We got Joseph, the favorite, the other brothers, and they could not stand him. They hated him, Scripture says. Could not even speak a kind word to, to Joseph. Now, when we keep reading here, we, we know that Joseph uh, had a couple of dreams. Remember this? If you're familiar with this, he had a couple of dreams that he shared with his brothers. And he said, look, these dreams are saying that someday you guys are going to bow down to me. Now, how do you think that went? Not real good, right? Not real good. What these dreams are saying is someday you guys will eventually be bowing down to me. It did not go good. We read in Scripture they began to plot his death. That's how good that went. Began to, to, to plot and think about what to do with their annoying little brother who was a daddy's boy. And, and eventually what they do in Scripture we read is they throw him into a cistern. And leave him for dead. But then one thinks, you know what? Uh, there's a slave trading group that's coming through. We could make some cash here. Why don't we pull him out and we'll sell him? So that's what they do. They don't kill him. Uh, they end up pulling him back out. Imagine being Joseph, right? You, you know, your, bro, your own flesh and blood. They, they throw you in a cistern. They hate you. They leave you there from dead. Then, and then they come back and you're thinking, Phew, you know, I would be. They're back. Ha ha, nice joke, guys. You know, I'd be laughing, you know, awkwardly. And then they sell you. 
you know, hopes are gone, boop, dashed, and they, they seldom imagine that. And so then they, they take this coat home, this, right, this coat that he had on, and they, they kill an animal, they put blood on it, and, they, and they, they present it to the father, and of course, you know, dad's thinking, my son has been killed, and begins his mourning. And again, I'll, uh, if we can, to try to put ourselves in, in Joseph's um, position here, um, man, how would you feel if your own flesh and blood did that to you? Can you imagine the feelings and the thoughts and the, uh, man, I, dumbfoundedness? I don't know. Maybe he knew it was coming. I mean, he could be a little annoying, honestly, when you read it. He was a little cocky. Um, but imagine that. Your own family uh, doing that and then selling you into slavery. We'd call that adversity, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in an instant. You know, he, he was daddy's boy. Things were good. He had this really cool coat, you know, and, and life was great. And, and, and in an instant, his brothers grab him and, and they change his life forever. And his life is totally changed just like that. As eventually as he sold into slavery. Have you, I just want to stop there. Have you ever been there before? Not, not being sold, but have you ever, has your life ever changed in an instant? Things are, things are okay, and then boom, your life has changed. You know, a lot of us in this room have experienced this, and some probably still will down the road, but uh, you go to the doctor, you're not feeling real great, life's been okay, but you, you hear the cancer word. You hear that word, and what do you do with that? You know, it, you hear cancer and whew, change, life change, just like that, in an instant. Yeah, Maybe a death in, uh, of a family member or someone close to you, a good friend, or, you know, life's fine and there's this unexpected death, and in an instant, life, man, life changes. Now, what do you do with that? How do, you, how do you handle that? Maybe it's financial. Maybe you get called into the office and, and the company's making cutbacks and they have to say, look, we're going to give you two weeks, but we're going to have to let you go. You got two weeks and then, and then you need to go. Man, what, what do you do with that? When you're trying to provide for a family and, and your life just changes. You got, have you been there? Well, all of a sudden, things totally change at the drop of a hat. These things, these things that happen to us, uh, these times of suffering or adversity, test our character, they shape us, they test our integrity, and how we handle them says a lot about who we are, our response. It really does. It says a lot about the heart and where our hearts are. Um, Joseph sold into slavery by his own brothers. He's taken to Egypt. Um, you think about how he could have responded. Now, again, put yourself there. How would you have responded? I probably would have fought back. And I don't know if Joseph did or not. We don't read that. But I probably would have retaliated. I know I'd be thinking, when I get out of this, my brothers are dead meat. Seriously. If my, Matt sold me into slavery, <laughs> when I got home, he would get a whooping. And I can still whoop him. Man, think about it. Where would your heart go? Where would your mind go? Would you retaliate? Would you fight? Would you, would you just quit and give up? Would you take your own life? I'm not going into slavery. I'll do anything but that. Would you, would you uh, curse God? God, why did you allow this to happen? I, I don't, I'm not even going to follow anymore. I quit. I give up. This isn't even... I mean, would, have you been to that point? Where life's been so tough, you're just like, I'm done. I'm not even going to follow. I don't know if I want to follow you anymore. How would our attitudes adjust? How would we be feeling when that adversity comes? And when we read this, and again, I'm sure Joseph wasn't feeling great. I'm sure, you know, he wasn't like drawing happy faces in the sand, you know, on his way to Egypt. But we don't see any of that here. And what we see is, is he, he seemed to, to keep moving forward in this adversity, um, even as they sold him into slavery. Um, it tests his character. This adversity. And this, we're going to look at this again because it's not the only time Joseph uh, faces adversity. But I want to move to the second test and we'll kind of flip-flop a little bit. The second test is this. Um, the prosperity test. Or maybe, maybe, maybe for us, uh, maybe the test of being comfortable. Um, and that, that one um, is a big one. You look at this. Look at Genesis 39. Flip over a couple chapters. 
Joseph had been sold into slavery, and uh, we're going to see kind of a, a switch a little bit. Now, granted, I know he's still a slave, but I want you to read these words. Genesis 39, 1 through 4. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the, or bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and, pros- and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in, the eye, in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. No, again, what, what kind of a switch? You're a slave, and now you're in the house of Potiphar, a well-known, powerful man, and you're put in charge of his household. Okay, you're moving, you're moving from adversity uh, into a place of prosperity. He prospered, and he was doing pretty well. And again, I get to thinking about our culture. Prosperity or even being comfortable um, contests our integrity. And maybe something that in our culture we're more used to than an adversity, really. Think about that. We're pretty comfortable. We're pretty comfortable. We have everything we need and more. Every single one of us here has everything we need and way more. So, so maybe for us, you know, adversity comes and goes, but maybe for us a bigger test is, is the prosperity. And maybe you don't say, maybe you say to yourself, I'm not prosperous. I don't, yeah, we are. Look at us. Look at us. No one in here is poor. We're not in poverty. We're very prosperous. And again, we have more than we need. And that's just as much a test of our integrity as adversity. Because think about this when things are good and we're comfortable, right? And we're prosperous and then things are good, what can tend to happen in our relationship with Jesus? Someone said last service, it goes on the back burner. Anyone been there? Things are good, you know, right? Nothing, you know, you're not in adversity. Right now, life is pretty good. You're doing your thing. You're making your money. Your family life's good. Everything's going well. And you kind of get on autopilot, don't you? And some t- and maybe you're not like this. If not, that's awesome. Praise God, okay? Um, maybe you should preach and teach us how, to, how you do it. Because a lot of us struggle with this. We get to move in and... Uh, our prayer life starts to kind of things are good you know we're not in the word as much you know we may not even fellowship with each other as much things are good right that happens all the time it's a test of of our integrity and we tend to forget we tend to to put it on the back burner uh, and we think we don't need him as much we've got everything we need and that's a lot of where America is honestly who needs God we got everything we need so we think and then when adversity hits, what happens? We run, we run back. Oop! We run back to God. God, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you. Right? So prosperity, man, what a, what a test of, of integrity. And, and here what, what's uh, really cool is we can, we can look at Joseph as he, as he moves into this time of prosperity and comfortability and growing and, and being in charge of all these things. And we see a moment here, at least this moment, where he does not forget who he is and he does not forget uh, his God. And uh, he, he gets tested big time during this time of prosperity. And so let's, let's keep reading. 39, uh, pick right where we left off, verse 5. Here we go. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all, of that, and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left, jo- he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. I don't even know what Potiphar did. He gave everything to, to Joseph. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. After a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. 
Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am, and my master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked, wicked thing and sin against two? God. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. He kept his integrity and his honor in the time of prosperity. When that temptation was right in front of him, he did not forget his God. I will not sin and do such a wicked thing against God. He didn't say, my master first. He didn't say, oh, that's wrong. I'm not going to do it just because it's wrong morally. I'm not. He said, I will not do such a wicked thing and sin against God. He didn't forget that is a huge test of integrity and honor <laughs> when that is right in front of your face. That is right in front of your face. He didn't forget. Now, when we read, and we just read a little bit, day after day, Potiphar's wife uh, made advances uh, to Joseph uh, to the point where she caught him by, <laughs> by, the, by his cloak and uh, propositioned him again and he ran away physically. He turned tail and ran and left his cloak in her hand. Remember this? If you're familiar with this story, if not, man, read it. It's incredible history. And he took off so fast. You gotta give him props, men, for that. Amen? That's strength in a man. He turned tail and ran and she's standing there holding his cloak and he's running down the hall in his skivvies. I don't even know. And what'd she do? She was so angry and so upset that he kept turning her down. What'd she do? She accused him, didn't she? Falsely. He took advantage of me. I have his cloak. He took advantage of me and turned the tide on him. And where did that land Joseph? In prison. Yeah, right back to adversity. So we see adversity, we see prosperity, we see adversity. It wasn't even his fault, right? He did the right thing, and he's in prison. Right back uh, to adversity. And this is where, I mean, it's, this is such awesome stuff because we see even in prison this, this difference of integrity versus not having integrity. As Joseph is in, in prison, he meets a couple guys and, and uh, one of them's the chief baker, one of them's the chief cupbearer. They're in prison and they have these crazy dreams and, and uh, Joseph interprets them uh, for them and he, and he tells the, the baker, you know, you're going to be executed and he tells the, the cupbearer that you're going to get your position back. You will get out of prison and you will get your position back. That's what these dreams are saying. Well, let's read a little bit. Genesis 40. Um, verses 14 through 15. This is what he's saying to the cupbearer, Joseph, while they're in prison. When all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention to me to Pharaoh, and, and I love this. Is he enjoying himself? Get me out of prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. So, so Cutburger, when you get your job back, when you get your position back, don't forget me. Get me out of here. Tell Pharaoh uh, that, that, uh, that I'm here and you can get me out of here. Don't forget me. What happens? Let's keep reading. Uh, jump down to verse 20. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer. So he got out, right? The chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position. Joseph is right. So that once he again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. Here we go, verse 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He what? He forgot him. He forgot him. As soon as this guy got out of prison and got back in his place of comfort and his position back, he forgot Joseph. What a difference we see in what integrity is and, and what it is not. And, and, and again, our integrity is being tested all the time. Guys, whether it's adversity or whether it's prosperity, how is your heart? How is my heart? How is my character? Do I live an honorable life, a life of integrity? Because it's being tested. 
I found this. There's a story about a salesman. He's waiting to see uh, his purchasing agent uh, so he could submit uh, his company's bid um, for this project. And while he was waiting, he noticed that on the desk, his competitor's bid was in the office by himself. He noticed his, his competitor's bid was sitting on this agent's desk. Now, you, you can imagine what kind of what's going on here. And he got to thinking to himself, uh, uh, I wonder what that looks like, but unfortunately, here's the problem. There was a Coke can sitting covering the bid. And so he couldn't see it. So, guys, you know, you know this. He, he got to thinking, okay, man, it'd be nice to see be nice to see what our competitors bid and no one's even going to know I'm in here all by myself so he reached over to lift up the Coke can but here's what happened. Uh, his heart sank because he just saw thousands of BBs pour out of the bottomless Coke can. And uh, just then the, the purchasing agent came in and that test was set up by that purchasing agent and obviously he, he failed and he didn't get the bid for his company. We're being tested all the time. No one was watching, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis, I love his definition of integrity. He says, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Think about that. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching, which means we're always being tested. Always. Um, I, think, I think about work, your place of employment. H how, how is your integrity where, where you're working? Are we known in, in the job place with our, our coworkers, the guys that are under us, the ladies that are under us or above us or around us? Are we known for being people of integrity? Are you known for having integrity at your place of employment? Are you known? Or are you known for maybe fudging some numbers here and there so we can look better or maybe we can get a little bit more out of this are you known for fudging some things or, or, or skimming some things just so we can get ahead a little bit you know erase a number here put it here add a little bit here you know no one's gonna get you know no one's gonna know how's our heart at work with those around us how's our heart in our family How's our integrity in our, in our, in our families? When, when someone hurts you, what's your response? Hurt them back? And that's natural, man. I'm not saying that's not unnatural. That's natural, okay? No one's faulting anyone for that. And please understand this, okay? This sermon this morning on integrity is for me. I don't know if it's for you. I'm preaching to myself this morning, <laughs> okay? There's 10 fingers pointing at me. How do you respond? Well, in our church family, how's your integrity? How's your honor? Do we honor one another in our church family? Because it's easy to, to come and meet and, and we're all happy and smiling. Hey, it's good to see you. Da, 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 da. And we can leave this room and we can say, oh, did you hear what she said? Do you know what she was just doing Friday night and she's here on Sunday morning? Oh, how dare her? Seriously. And we can leave this and we can talk about each other and we can gossip about each other and we can say all this nasty stuff about each other. Sunday morning comes, hey, good morning, how are you? Oh, things are good. They're fake because that's a paint job with a bunch of rust underneath of it. How's our integrity? How's our honor with one another? And again, please understand, I'm pointing at myself, okay? How's our integrity? How's our integrity in private? Where's our honor in private? When we're home alone, fellas, and wife's gone, kids are gone, and you're on the computer. Man, every man in here knows that pull. Every man in here knows that temptation. And if, where, where's our honor and our integrity? God, we've got to work on this, and we've got to keep moving forward in this, to live with integrity and honor, um, it takes commitment. It takes uh, intentionality. That word comes up a lot. We have to be intentional. Um, and again, when we look at we look at Joseph's life, we see that that uh, we see some commitments that kind of pop out. Um, and the first one is this, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, I, I really debated about putting this one in here. We're going to look at four commitments, um, just because it can get uncomfortable. Uh, 
And I really, I did, I even asked Silas, I'm like, man, should I put this in here? And after we talked about it, we was like, yep, we're, we're not taking this out because uh, we can't bury our heads here. The first one is this, as we look at, at Joseph, he was com- had a commitment of purity. Joseph had a commitment of purity. He was committed to staying sexually pure in spite of the temptation right in front of his face. Again, I, I, this is pretty incredible. And I'm coming from, this is coming from a guy perspective, okay? This is amazing what he did. This took strength. This took conviction. This took, this took commitment. And it's what an example for us. Because here's the thing. This is a tough one in our culture, in our times. Sexual purity. This is such a battle for so many people with all the images, with all that's going on around us, what we're watching, what we're listening to, what we're putting in our brains. Uh, it's, it's everywhere around us. You can't even walk down the mall, guys and, and gals, without seeing things that, that, that shouldn't be seen. And it tests our, our conviction, our commitment to having sexual purity. And the thing is, it's taking so many of us out in the church. It's taking us out left and right in the church. Not just pastors, but everybody. People are struggling with this. It's such a battle. And here's the thing, I'm just doing some reading on this. It's not even a man problem. We focus so much on men that the rise of sexual addiction for women is on the rise and it's, it's pornography, it's all kinds of stuff. It's, ladies, it's not what you see, it's what you're reading. Fifty Shades of Bulloni <laughs> is pornography. It is a distortion of what God has created. Porneo, it is distorts. It's Fifty Shades of, you know, I want to say something else that I won't say. It's not just a guy problem. And, and what's happening, guys, is, and listen to me, in a room with this many people, I know that there are some of us that struggle with this. If we continue, and if you've got no help, if you've not said anything, and we continue to keep this stuff in the dark, women, if you continue to keep this stuff in the dark, men, if you continue to keep this a secret, the only thing that happens to us is a hard heart, and your engine will remain broken, and your heart will be broke, and it will get hard to the things of God, to his word, to your relationship, if you keep this a secret, if you are struggling with pornography this morning, if you are addicted sexually outside of marriage or any of those things and you are struggling with that, bring it into the light. I challenge you to get help. If you remain in the dark, your heart, your heart, your heart will grow hard. Bring it into the light. Forget your paint job and looking good for a while and fix the engine. Begin to work on that. And you can join all the other men in this room who on some level struggle with the same thing you do. Women, if you're struggling with that, you need to bring it into the light and you need to find someone in this room or someone you can trust and confess it and bring it out into the light. Second thing, commitment of attitude. Um, Again, if you stop and think about this, um, how would your attitude be if you got sold into slavery? <laughs> how would your attitude be? How would your attitude be if you were falsely accused for something you didn't do and you ended up in prison for it? And I'm not talking about a prison kind of like what we have today where they can you know, lay in their bunks, eat cafeteria food and, and watch TV and lift weights and have yard time. I'm talking about a dark dungeon that is full of bodily fluids and nastiness. Dark and I don't know about you, but my attitude would probably not be very good. I'm just being honest. I'd probably be really mad in the corner, okay, feeling sorry for myself or yelling at people or just upset because I'm here and I didn't even do anything. How would your attitude be? Well, we see, we see that, 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 again, Joseph had to have his moments where it was hard to deal with. We see, get me out of here. I don't want to be here. He had to have those moments. But we see him continue to trust. We can see him, um, we're going to read here, continue to serve even in prison. He didn't pout in his corner. He continued to serve. Look, look, at, look at scripture here. Uh, chapter 39, verses 21 through 23. But the Lord was with him. This is when he was in prison. 
uh, right at the end of verse 20, it says, But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was what? With him. It's pretty awesome. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for, what, uh, for, that was, uh, for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success, excuse me, in whatever he did. He kept going. He kept moving forward. Now, here's a phrase I, I really sometimes I can't stand and when people say it to me, I just want to tell them to shut up. <laughs> we can't change our circumstances, but we can change our attitudes. Have you heard that? Sometimes that's annoying. I get that. I do. And when you're in a, when you're in a circumstance that's just not good and your attitude's not real great and someone says that, I'm like, mm -hmm, you know, but it's true. We can't change our circumstances always, but we can change how we look at it and our attitude towards it. It's, it's so true. And what happens with a bad attitude, and we have to understand this, when our attitudes get so bad, what it does is it begins to corrupt our integrity. It can do that. It begins to eat away at our character with a really bad attitude. And it can corrupt our integrity. Third one is this, commitment of faithfulness. Got to keep moving here. Joseph was faithful. Uh, he, he, he did the right thing. He, he never forgot God. He was faithful to his God and he would do the right thing. In spite of, this is what's incredible, in spite of no guarantee that it would better his circumstances, he would still choose to do the right thing. And we're going to see more of that here. He chose what was right. He, he was faithful to God with Potiphar's wife. He was faithful to God while he was in prison. And again, this faithfulness to him, this choosing the right thing, uh, is, is our call as followers. In adversity or in prosperity? Are we doing the right thing no matter what? Are we faithful to him no matter what? No matter what? I want to read another quote. It says this, Integrity is not just about who you are. This is pretty cool. It's not just about who you are, but who you seek to become. Right? We're all, we're all becoming, remember? What is it that you're becoming? So integrity is not just about who you are. It's about what you, are, uh, what you seek to become. When we have integrity, we don't need to pretend. Think about that phrase. I, I try, I'm trying to do my best. I'm not good at this, but I, I do my best to teach this to my kids. When we we're honest and we do what's right, we tell the truth. Even when we screwed up, we own up to it and we tell the truth. It's a relief because when, when, we're, when we're not having integrity and when we're just pretending and we're gonna cover up a lie with another lie with another lie with another lie with another lie, that's exhausting, is it not? Been there. It's not fun. It, it exhausts you. But if we could just have integrity, and, and uh, sometimes, guys, we just got to own up to what we've done. It's freeing. I don't have to pretend to have that right. Or I know I screwed up. I'm not even going to pretend I did it right. I'm not going to have any excuses. Oh, my goodness, that's like a weight off your shoulders. Now, there will be consequences, maybe, probably. But whew, integrity, I'm transparent, authentic, crystal clear. Do you, does that make sense? I don't have to pretend. That Man, it's exhausting to pretend to keep that paint job looking good. It's exhausting, especially when your engine's not running right. It's tough. Third is this, or lastly is this, fourth, a commitment of consistency. Again, we, we see this throughout Joseph's life, um, this consistency uh, in his purity and his attitude and his faithfulness. Uh, go, to, go to Genesis 50, and I know this is a big jump, um, because a lot goes on from 39 and 40 to 50. Um, there's so much that goes on. But, I, but we see um, Joseph be consistent. Okay? Uh, in Genesis 50, Joseph is, is out of prison. Uh, he gets out. He's back on top. Okay, he's put in second, uh, second in command in, in Pharaoh in Egypt. And uh, he's back on top. He's back in prosperity again. He's doing really, really well. Now, through a series of events, uh, he's met his brothers. Uh, in the meantime, uh, he, he's presented himself to them. They know who he is. Uh, there's been a famine in the land. That's why they're there. They're there to get food, supplies. And throughout all this, now we know that Joseph and his brothers know who each other are. 
Okay? And we're going to pick up to where uh, we're at the end of this. And uh, his brothers are in front of Joseph. He has all this power. Second in command. What does he say to them? Uh, let's start with verse 18. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. And what do they say? We are your slaves. Dream come true. 19. Guys, this is, this is an incredible moment. Remember, it's his brothers, the ones who did what? Started the whole thing. They sold him into slavery. They're gonna this is incredible. He says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke, spoke, spoke kindly to them. You want to talk about a test of your character? When, when, when the men who were responsible for your slavery and, and this whole mess that started with are, are bowing before you, you have all the power and you could have easily have had them executed with no re repercussion. Um, wow. Wow, what a, what a heart there. As he looks to his God and says, what you intended to harm me, Man, guys, that's, that's not seeing with human eyes. That's, that's seeing something. That's, that's seeing eternity there. What you intended to harm me, God intended for good. And, I'm, and a lot of lives were saved because of that. And, and Joseph's wisdom as they took care of the famine and the drought. Amazing, amazing test of character. He had all that power and he showed mercy. He had all that power and he showed love. And he never forgot who he was and the God that he served. So just some questions as we start to wind down. Are we committed to consistency in our walk with Christ? And, and again, I don't know about you, but, but I see my consistency seems to be I take a step forward, I take a step backwards, right? You take two steps forward, you take a step back. You take, uh, you know, it's consistent. Are, are we consistent in our walk with Christ? Are we known, again, for our integrity, are we consistent at work? Are we consistent at home? Are we consistent uh, in, our, in our families? And do we keep our word or do we break it? Do you say what you're going to do and do it? Or are you the guy that, that says, you know, we need something done? Well, he said he was going to do it, but I don't know if he'll show up. Is that, is that, I mean, am I, am I that guy? No, don't call him because... He's not going to, he won't show up. How about you yes be yes and your no be no? Again, when we're all alone, where's our integrity? This is so important for us as, as followers, um, as, as Christians. Um, and I just got to think, man, do we look like the world? Do we, do we look like the world? Are we, are we looking any different when it comes to integrity and honor and, and character in the church? Do we look any different? Do we look like Joseph and the character qualities he explained? More importantly, do we look like Jesus? Most importantly, and the integrity that he had doing exactly what he came to do and getting it done. Um, I want to walk through some of these questions at the end and then we'll, we'll be finished. But um, as, as we look at the tests, um, which one of those are you in right now? Which one of these tests am I currently in? And the truth is, everyone in this room is in one or the other right now. N not one of us escapes this question. Um, am, I, am I in adversity right now? Am I going through a trial, a hard time right now? That might be you. Um, and, and you're being tested. Am I, things are okay and I'm doing good. You know, prosperity, I'm, I'm comfortable. Every single one of us is, is in one of these categories right now in this moment how's your integrity in it all how's our integrity um when we look at the four commitments that we need to take action on um do i need to take action on purity do i need to do something do i need to take a step uh my attitude how about your faithfulness to god doing the right thing in his name for him staying faithful to him the right way no matter what um, in your consistency, in your relationship, um, in your commitment to Him. 
I don't know about you, but you know, you can look at that list um, and I can see at least two <laughs> that jump out at me. Boom. Um, that that uh, I need to move forward in. Um, just look at that and if there's something up there that, that catches you and you're like, yep, um, please don't leave here without moving in it. Whether that's grabbing a brother or a sister, um, you can come up front at the end, we can pray, we can talk about it, we can devise a way to walk with you, whatever we need to do. Um, there's so many good people here and so many good resources and um, so many good things. If it's a sexual addiction, we have a place to plug you right into with people who are going through the same thing. You're not alone. Don't leave this place without, without doing something and making it, taking action on that. And that's really the challenge is take some action, move, take a step. And that may mean uh, you need to confess to start with. Um, guys, it takes guts. That's not fun. Um, it's not fun to confess something you've been keeping secret, is it? And I'm guessing some of us in this room haven't done that yet. Um, I pray for courage and conviction there um, for all of us um, to confess, uh, to get help, um, repent, not just confess, but turn and, and go the other way. I mean, we can confess all we want and go back. Confess and repent, turn, um, get, get that help that you need that we can do that uh, together. Um, question that I, that I wanna ask and then we're gonna read some scripture. Be done. I don't love this question to be honest with you because sometimes um, we can be our harshest critics, at least. Um, is that, that true for you? Um, sometimes we're really hard on ourselves. Uh, maybe this is a question for some people that we can trust around us, but, but uh, this question came up this week, and it was, when I look inside my heart, do I like what I see? When I look inside my heart, do I like what I see? And again, I, when I start thinking about that, I think, oh, geez, that's a tough question to answer for myself because usually what I see is the garbage. I see the brokenness, the, the things I have to, you know, fix. Um, maybe that's a question for your spouse or for someone that you just trust and will tell you the truth and be honest and, and love you through it. Um, but when people see us as, as Christians, NLCC folks, if you're visiting with us, awesome. Um, when people look at our hearts and they see our lives and they see what we do, do they see integrity? Do they see hearts that belong to him? And again, integrity doesn't mean um, your paint job's perfect at all. But at least we can be honest with people in our struggles. At least have the integrity and the honesty to say, here's where I struggle. And I am not good at this, but I'm, but I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm going after the Lord. Um, I stumble, I fall, I mess up. Um, that's not worrying about your paint job, guys. Scrap the paint job. <laughs> um, that's taking care of your heart and your engine. It's just letting people know we can at least have that much integrity um, with those around us. I'm gonna have you stand. I'm gonna read um, Psalm 15 as we close. And I'm gonna read this as we, as we stand up and read it. Um, what I love about this, too, this was written by David, who, who had moments where his integrity wasn't so good, right? We know, if you're familiar with David, the Bathsheba incident, that sounds like a book or a movie or something. Uh, Bathsheba, he wasn't the man, he didn't always, he struggled with his integrity at moments in his life, uh, but he's also known as a man after God's own heart, which can give us so much hope with this. Um, he wrote this. A man who struggled with his integrity. Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose, talk, or whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart. Man, that's good. Whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, who do, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Pretty awesome, pretty awesome. Um, I'm gonna pray, and again, if there's something that uh, you need to make a decision, please come forward, please find someone here. If you don't know Jesus, you're outside of Christ and you've been coming for a while and you've never made that decision, please choose him. 
please make a decision. Um, time is short. Time is short. Give your life, man. You will not, you will not regret it. Um, it's so awesome. So I, I just want to throw that out there. Um, if you need to be prayed for, if you have something you want to uh, pray about, please let us know that as well. Uh, and we would love to pray with you. Uh, I'm going to pray and, and uh, we'll be uh, deployed. Father, we thank you again for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the people who've gone before us uh, and this history that you've given us, your word and, and uh, the example. Uh, we can learn from, from imperfect people who did not do everything right, um, but God are an example of people who struggled but struggled well, um, just like we do. So we thank you for Joseph and and God, just the example we looked at this morning uh, of a man who, again, who didn't live a perfect life, but, but um, as an example of character as he walked through life and had his ups and had his downs, but continued um, and did some incredible things um, as he always remembered you. Father, I just pray that, that you would do that in our hearts. Make us a people of integrity. God, do what that takes um, to make us a people of honor and character and, and maybe, Lord, um, <laughs> that you will be done that we would get back maybe some of what we've lost with the culture. That we would turn the ship in Jesus' name um, and people would be jumping on board with us, God, because, because they see you in it and they see imperfect people but a God who loves imperfect people and gives grace and walks with them. Thank you for being with Joseph the whole time. The, God, your scripture says you were with him the whole time. The Lord was with him. The Lord, praise you, for God, for that. And that we know that that's true in our lives. So may we never forget that. Um, as we leave this place, may we use your word in our lives. May we get into it outside of these walls. Um, God, may we encourage one another outside of these walls. May we walk with one another outside of these walls and love one another outside of these walls. Um, all in your name and for your glory. We just pray these things in your name. Amen.